Thanks, Helen. There we go. All right. I'd like to call to order the February 26th meeting of the New Canaan Board of Education. Um, in front of you, you have the minutes from our February 5th meeting. If I could have you take a look at those and after you've looked at them, if I could get a motion to approve those minutes. Do I have a motion? Brendan? Second? Hazel? All those in favor? Uh, so it's unanimous with one abstention. Um, okay, moving on to the review and approval of the agenda. We have one addition to tonight's meeting. We are adding an executive session uh, in accordance with Connecticut General Statutes 1 225, and the subject to, this, uh, to be discussed is negotiations. Do I have a motion to amend the agenda? Sherry? Second? Katrina? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Um, and then could I have a motion to approve the uh, agenda as amended? Penny, second, Brendan. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. Do I have anyone wishing to address the board this evening? If you could just um, state your name and Hi, good evening. My name is Karen Willett. Um, I have two boys here in the district, a sixth grader at Sachs and my kindergarten over there at West. Um, I wanted to take just a minute to read aloud um, a letter we got signed, written, who, that was written and signed by the doctors at the New Canaan Pediatrics in support of moving school start times for grades seven through 12 to 8.30 or later. Dear Board of Education, we applaud your examination of school start times as it relates to the health and well-being of our children. The evidence for later school start times for adolescents is compelling. Communities that have delayed start times have shown increased academic performance, reported decreased mood disorders, and experienced significantly reduced automobile accident rates in teens. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention both strongly support delayed school start times for adolescents. The evidence supporting this recommendation includes both the unique biological needs of adolescents and the health and safety benefits realized by communities that have later start times. In our practice, we clearly see a trend of teenagers from neighboring communities with later start times reporting more sleep than those from communities like New Canaan that have earlier start times. We understand that the practical hurd hurdles to changing existing start times are significant, but the compelling benefit to our children and the community in general makes the change to a later start time for middle and high school students worth it. Thanks for your efforts. Sincerely, William Flynn, Eva Grunberg, Alyssa Newman, uh, Maria Ianni, and um, oh, that's it, William Flynn. Um, it's also worth noting how easy it was to get these signatures and also signatures from all of the doctors at New England Pediatrics and any other pediatrician we could find in New Canaan. And similarly, similarly um, the parents in Greenwich, Ridgeport, I mean, uh, sorry, Ridgefield and Westport gathered signatures from every pediatrician practicing in those towns as well. And the last thing really quickly I wanted to mention is that a few days ago, or about a month ago actually, um, Princeton Public Schools, the number one ranked district in New Jersey, voted to move their start time for their high school to 8.20 a.m. Uh, starting in September. Um, that school district is, um, like I said, the district is number one in New Jersey and is 155 in the U.S. News ranking. Uh, in other words, I think it is safe to say that the district is similar to ours and the kids there face similar pressures. The superintendent there said, the district has been looking holistically at student wellness issues and stress and that the time change is just one effort of many to help students. He said, the research is clear. A later start time does make a difference. 15 I'm, seconds. I'm proud of our district for having the courage to make this change that so many districts wish they could make. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board this evening? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to uh, reports and recognition. Um, and the first item on our agenda under reports and recognition is the teacher evaluation and professional learning plan with Dr. Crenty and Ms. Woolett. Good evening. 
Uh, thank you for having Chris and I here this evening to talk about the teacher evaluation and professional learning plan. Um, one of our objectives under District Goal 3 is to continue to utilize the New Canaan Teacher Evaluation and Professional Learning Plan to evaluate staff and promote professional goal, uh, growth. Our ultimate goal is to improve instruction and student learning. Tonight, Chris Wallach, who's the principal over at East School, and I will be giving you a brief overview of the plan and sharing how teachers are growing with their professional growth plans. Um, we have some teachers here in the audience this evening that were actually interviewed. Um, when we put out a call to teachers that, uh, to see if anybody would like to come forward and talk about their professional growth plans, um, it was overwhelming the amount of teachers who were so excited to share their stories about what they're doing, how they're researching a particular area, how they're growing in their practice, and how they're ultimately um, helping their students to grow. So I know Zoe Robinson was interviewed, Darren Bruce, uh, our writing specialist is here this evening. He was interviewed. Unfortunately, Darren's interview is not in the clip this evening. Um, oh, I know, I'm so sorry. Oh. Um, but the reason being is the teachers were so passionate about what they were saying that the video clip ended up being about 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, and I know that would have, I could have just hit play and sat down, but um, that wouldn't have um, been in everybody's best interest. So we are going to put the video clip together. We're going to post it on the district website for all to view. Um, but we do have a few uh, of the clips this evening that we'll be sharing with you. Um, so I do want to introduce Chris Wallach, who will um, begin our presentation this evening. Good evening. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with the components of our TEPL system from past presentations that we've shared with the board, um, but it is a pleasure tonight to be able to update you on our plan and specifically to be able to celebrate the manner in which our teachers have leveraged the TEPL system um, to, to provide opportunities for their own growth um, and to really support the ongoing growth and innovation of our schools and our district um, in support of student learning. First, we'd like to recognize um, the many members of the TEPL committee, um, and you see them here on the slide before you. Um, this is a committee that, as you can see, cuts across grade, grade levels, it cuts across departments, it includes curriculum coordinators, it includes administrators. Um, so it, it's really a committee that has captured a variety of perspectives in the district and wants to ensure that all stakeholders um, are included in the decision making. Um, some of these members of the committee have been a part of this committee since 2010 which was when the committee first started meeting. At that time, it was really a committee committed to um, research and design, researching best practices in adult professional learning, uh, and then moving into the design phase of our TEPL system, and then supporting implementation. Over the past several years, we've grown in our membership by um, connecting with our professional learning committee in the district. So those two committees, the TEPL committee and our district professional development or professional learning committee have joined. Um, and that's been intentional because the, the TEPL work has moved beyond design and implementation and really to the ongoing um, sustainability of professional growth in our district and wanting to support that. And of course our professional development, or professional now professional learning committee um, in our district has continued to be committed to that. So this allows us to have some coherence and consistency in terms of ensuring that our professional learning days, our professional learning sessions before and after school, as well as those job embedded components of the TEPL system that all support professional growth are unified and we can have um, collaborative conversations about best leveraging all of those different vehicles we have for the professional growth of our staff. As a guiding principle, when the TEPL committee began its work, um, the group was committed to designing a system that was growth oriented um, and that would serve the needs of our staff um, to have opportunities for professional learning. And even in the name of our system, the TEPL system, TEPL stands for Teacher Evaluation and Professional Learning. Um, it was very intentional, the, the wording in that name, because we knew at the time, back in 2010, that the state was mandating that we as a district commit to a teacher evaluation system. Um, but we leveraged that opportunity um, to design a system that was not merely evaluation, but was also going to serve all of our teachers as a growth system to provide teachers, whether they're beginning their career, whether they're well into their career, um, whether they're you know, developing as a teacher or whether they're really at a high level of accomplished practice and exemplary practice, we wanted all staff members to have opportunities to grow in this system. 
Um, so we approached the development of the TEPL system with that in mind um, and wanted to ensure that there were components in the system that would support the growth of individuals in our district, growth of our schools, and growth of, for us as a district. Um, so you'll see as, as we continue to share this evening those different components that, that support those different levels of our, our district. The TEPL process itself each year consists of ongoing um, reflection on the part of staff, ongoing opportunities to have dialogue with supervisors, administrators, ongoing opportunities to collect evidence, to look at student work, um, to look at data. And sometimes that's quantitative data, quantitative data, sometimes that's qualitative data, student work samples, video clips from the classroom, um, and to receive feedback. Um, we've captured that in this slide as a, as a cycle. Um, so the visual image here is not linear. It's not meant to be a system that starts in August or September and ends in June. What we encourage staff is to think over time how they're continuing to grow. And often we'll have staff members who over the course of the year start to unpack an area of study for themselves. And by the time they're reflecting in the spring, they're already thinking ahead to the following year and already deciding where they want to go deeper in their professional learning. Um, and what that allows over time is for teachers to really study an aspect of their practice in depth and in an ongoing way. What we're going to share with you now is a clip of a, of a teacher where you hear this reflective piece as she's thinking about um, her ongoing study, professional study throughout the year, the way she's implemented some strategies in the classroom, um, the way she's analyzed some evidence from her classroom, and is thinking about her next steps. It's in illustrative of the type of process that teachers are moving through throughout the year. Um, this particular clip is from a second grade teacher, uh, Kelly Giernes. Each year, as a teacher, I pick a learning focus that's going to help me grow and learn as an educator. This year, I decided to focus on student empowerment. I've been a classroom teacher in second grade for a while now, and I pretty much know the curriculum and what students should be learning, but I wanted to help build student engagement. We live in a world where we don't really want kids to wait for an opportunity to come to them. We want them to be self-starters. So how can I teach that at a very young age? Um, and so what I did is I've been doing some research about how to allow students to feel empowered in their own learning. Um, learning looks different for everyone. And, and students each have their own interests. So it's about embracing a student's interest and their type of learning style and giving them a little bit of flexibility with what and how they learn. After doing some research, I started with the area of social studies. And I started with the essential question that I wanted students to learn in our first unit. Um, and that was what makes Connecticut a great place to live. And so I had them brainstorm themselves what would they need to research to find out more information about why Connecticut's such a great place to live. So after they did some researching and some questioning, they decided to focus on an area that they wanted to learn more about. Did they want to learn more about our state government? or certain symbols in our states, or some of the famous people that come from Connecticut, some of the laws. And after they researched what they wanted to find more about, they also then found a way to present it. Um, we pretended to have a museum, and so I had students create a gift shop of merchandise that would represent our state. I had a couple of students create a new show about um, why Connecticut would be a great place to visit and some of their pla favorite places to visit. Um, I had students do create artwork that would hang in this museum. So students use some of their talents. I have some very talented artists. Um, and they decided to create that artwork because that would be representative of them. I think at first, for me, it was about giving up some of the control, which was hard. I think a lot of times we view learning as looking a certain way. And I had to embrace the idea that because our students are different learners, learning doesn't look the same to everyone. So what you hear from Kelly there is some deep reflection on her practice and, um, and the work that she's implemented over the course of this year. And our system, our TEPL system, has been designed to ensure that there are multiple points of contact for teachers to be able to reflect, but also to receive feedback throughout the year. Our next slide here shares with you um, some of the, the opportunities that staff have for those points of contact. And those are points of contact with an administrator, um, with their, at times it's a curriculum coordinator, um, 
meaning a, an administrator who's working, say, across a department across the district. Um, but in those oppor opportunities for feedback, there's also opportunities for reflection. So this comes through growth conferences that are held periodically throughout the year. Typically, there's a, an initial growth conference at the start of the year where teachers are really sharing their plans, a uh, mid-year opportunity for a growth conference, and then an end year. But as I mentioned before, often those end years are already looking ahead to the following year um, in a growth conference. In addition to that, there are observations that occur throughout the year for all teachers. Some teachers have formal um, observations that are scheduled. Um, plan for, they're announced, there may be a, a pre-conference to discuss the lesson plan that will be implemented and a post-conference to debrief. More and more, our teachers are selecting um, an option called mini observations. These are unannounced, they're shorter, um, but they're more frequent throughout the year. And they, can, they are occurring um, woven into the fabric of a teacher's day. So it might be um, that an administrator comes into a classroom in the midst of a, of a lesson and then is, is capturing um, snippets to share with the teacher in terms of some feedback. Um, that feedback can come through a, a, an email, um, through our Talent Ed platform that we use um, to, for our uh, TEPL system, or it can come and or it comes through verbal conversations uh, after a mini observation. And that's what's been most powerful are those opportunities to connect with teachers orally, discuss you know, their thoughts, say on a lesson, or it could be coming um, from a data meeting. It could be an observation, a mini observation that occurred during a PPT. It could be a team meeting time. Um, any of these opportunities during the day where a teacher's involved in his or her professional work, um, they may want feedback and request the feedback from administrators. And that's another component of mini observations. They can be unannounced, but they can also be um, selected by the teacher to say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this in my classroom. This is what's going to be happening. Could you stop in? I'd really love some feedback. And building that into our system allows teachers to have multiple opportunities throughout the year to receive feedback, to reflect on their practice um, across all areas uh, of their work, um, and, and be able to continue to grow. So we've um, ensured that that can happen in an ongoing way. It's not just one observation. Um, for the year, it's ongoing points of contact for, for staff. In these moments of reflection, in these moments of feedback, these, these opportunities for dialogue, um, teachers are grounded in what's called our effective teaching framework. It's really a, a cornerstone of our TEPL system. Uh, it outlines across six domains of practice the elements that we have identified as a district as elements of effective teaching. And this was through research. We had a consultant um, who worked with us in developing this effective teaching framework. We've outlined approximately 30 uh, indicators embedded within those six domains um, that really identify effective practice in teaching. This framework allows for specific, converse, specific language in those conversations um, of reflection and feedback. We have, you're, you're seeing here, the, the domains for teachers. We also have developed um, frameworks for other roles that we have in the district, our school psychologists, our school social workers, speech language pathologists, special education teachers. Those all begin with this effective teaching framework as a base, and then they've been customized, customized to really capture the specific uh, elements of those other roles that make them um, specialized. And that allows conversations, both at the reflection time and um, in times of feedback, to be specific and uh, focused on that staff member's role um, and position. It also allows all of us to develop shared language um, and allow all of us, meaning both administrators and teachers, to be able to work together to decide where are their um, areas of interest for continuing to grow and where are their strengths that we want to celebrate uh, and recognize. Within each domain and indicator, there are descriptors. So once you move into a given indicator, a teacher is able to look at specific bullet point descriptors uh, that are mapped across a continuum, a continuum that moves from below standard to developing to accomplished and then to exemplary. And this allows teachers to reflect on where they are in their practice in a very specific way using the framework uh, and also to do some goal setting for themselves. 
We do have uh, curriculum coordinators and coaches within our schools who use this tool with the teachers they're working with to have collaborative conversations um, as they're reflecting on practice together um, and looking to, to make decisions about where uh, a staff member may want to grow, where they might want to engage in some collaborative study together. Um, and sometimes that happens even at a team level of teams deciding that perhaps this area of questioning they want to, to have conversations about and share resources. Um, that we have indicators with regard to feedback to students, learning targets, and what staff members have done is they're selecting different areas of focus is they form study groups that meet together and share resources um, and research these different areas where they'd like to grow in a very specific way. As teachers are developing these plans, this becomes a very powerful growth tool for them um, that they have some choice and ownership of. Um, and I think that's where we're seeing some of the most um, enthusiasm with regard to our professional learning. Uh, and at this time, I'm going to let Dr. Crenty share with you a little bit more about these growth plans and also some examples of teachers um, talking about their growth plans. So as Chris mentioned, the growth plan begins with teacher reflection, and teachers have an opportunity to go back to take a look at the six domains, take a look at the 30 indicators. When they're creating their professional growth plan, they are only choosing one indicator that they would like to focus on. So when you saw the video with Kelly, she had chosen student engagement, which really sits within our learning strategies, which is, I believe, indicator number two under domain number three. Um, and that was really her area of focus. And she really spent some time researching student engagement um, and understanding how she can improve her practice and ultimately improve the student learning. So so when you're looking at the professional growth plans, it serves dual purposes. One is for the teacher to professionally grow in their practice, to research a specific area, to learn more about it, and to improve their instruction. And two, to ultimately impact student learning. And that student learning can be in um, a quantitative measure. At the end of the year, they might report out quantitatively or it could be qualitative. Um, so there's two different ways that teachers can show um, how students have learned from their professional growth plans. We are always encouraging teachers to take a risk. Um, so we know that sometimes you take a risk and you research something and maybe it didn't go the way that you want it to. Um, and that's not held against you. That's part of your reflection. That's part of what you discuss. That's part of um, where you go for next year or possibly even in January when you sit with your administrator and have a mid-year conference and make a decision about I'm going to shift my plan because I need to focus more in on feedback. I thought I was thinking about questioning, but really when I began my research and started working with my students, I realized it's more the feedback that I'm giving to my students versus the questioning. So teachers have that flexibility to switch their focus throughout the year as well. Um, I am going to share one video clip with you. So in the first video clip, you heard a teacher talking about how she uh, grew in her area. In this video, you're going to hear from two of our district leaders who have selected an area of growth in leadership. Um, but they're going to discuss not only how they grow as leaders, but how they have to help the people within their departments to grow. Um, and that's a big part of their job as a leader. So they usually sit within one of the domains, either domain five or six, and they talk about how they're going to work with the people within their department to help the people within their department grow in their practice. Um, we're here to talk a little bit about our uh, professional growth plans, uh, both of our growth um, we're here to talk a little bit about our uh, professional growth plans. Uh, both of our growth plans are based on role-based uh, leadership. Um, my goal specifically is to work with the teachers in my department on helping them achieve their goals. And why the work that we did today is so important is because it gives them exposure to other teachers' practice, um, best practices. It allows them to collaborate not only with teachers in their building, but with teachers in the middle school. Um, and these conversations will help them come up with, hopefully, ideas to better their practice. So, um, and when that happens, obviously, students benefit. 
I think in my role as K-8 district coordinator, it's very important to not lose sight of the high school. So this alignment work with Anthony helps us bridge our curriculum to ensure that all students are successful and we're exposing them to the same standards and level of success we expect from all of them. I think the opportunity to go over to the high school uh, over the last couple of months has really given us the opportunity to really think about how we deliver our instruction here and what best practices we can take from the high school and also incorporate here and then also being able to give them the insight of what students learn here, not only in the advanced classes, but giving them the opportunity to see some of our grade level classes in order to inform instruction moving forward. So what Anthony and Zoe are actually reflecting upon are some visits that they've done um, with actual math teachers. So the middle school math teachers had gone over to the high school and they did some walkthroughs in the classrooms at the high school and then they came out and they had conversations about what they observed and what they noticed. Um, and then the high school teachers had an opportunity to head over to Saks and do the same and come out and have a conversation about what they saw and about the vertical alignment. Um, and also sometimes we do have children who are sitting in a geometry class in eighth grade, um, so they want to make sure that that vertical alignment also exists within those classes as well. Um, and so it's been really beneficial and certainly Zoe's here to answer questions afterwards um, if you have any. <laughs> um, so as we, whoops, did I go ahead one? <laughs> um, so as we were talking before, the professional growth plan really um, begins with the self-reflection. It's grounded in our effective teaching framework, um, and because we have a framework in a variety of areas, whether you're a school psychologist or whether you're a social worker or a classroom teacher, you're able to find something in the, that framework that will meet your needs and help you to grow. Um, and then obviously it has to have the capacity to measure that student impact. So on the next slide, you're going to see uh, the professional growth plan and what the professional growth plan looks like. Um, so we call this our PGP. Um, and the staff begin with the self-reflection. And then what's really important is they develop a learning focus um, and they create a goal that's going to impact students. And then they begin to map out that, out that plan. So what are they going to do throughout the course of the year? Um, what will they study? What resources might they use? And who will they collaborate with? The collaboration piece is quite big for the teachers. And probably for the last three or four years, they've engaged themselves in study groups. So they've been meeting with teachers who have similar indicators that they're working on. And they've removed whether they're working in the same department or whether they're working on the same grade level. And now they're having conversations about what does student engagement look like? What does feedback look like? Look like? What does questioning look like? So they're really um, engaging in that study. They'll listen to webinars, they'll uh, gather professional texts, um, and they'll be able to have conversations. We use um, some of our professional learning hours, um, our before school and after school times. Um, the teachers will come together and they'll work in their study groups um, to help improve their practice. Um, another big piece of this is really talking about um, the impact that has on their professional practice and obviously the impact that it has on the student learning as well. So I'm going to give you another little example of a PGP. And I chose for my area of focus for the TEPL um, this year, my PGAP to look at student writing, um, specifically working with multimodal writing. Um, I did some research, um, reading what people are doing in first year writing courses at the college level and attending that conference was critical. And then speaking with my colleagues, um, Mike McAteer is really a at the forefront of this type of writing here at the high school. Um, and tweaked my assignments first and then brought it to the students. Some of them, some of the assignments I was doing already were this form of writing. Um, I do an anatomy of a scene assignment um, that is modeled after the New York Times anatomy of a scene where my film students um, look at a scene of a Hitchcock film very closely and do scene analysis. Um, and it's a video essay where they're using their text and image uh, to look closely at what the director is trying to achieve. With my seniors and the Yukon Honors class specifically, um, I then 
developed another assignment a, on visual culture where they took this a concept of visual culture um, and applied it to their world. And they created these multimodal Adobe Spark pages, again, combining text and image um, to explore and examine an, an idea. And what really came out of these pieces was that it was more authentic writing. Students were writing about things that they cared about. Some of the difficulties were in the transferring of information. Students are very conditioned and understand how to write a five paragraph essay. Um, we're preparing them for college and the real world where the fair five paragraph essay doesn't really exist. So, <laughs> so that just gives you an example um, of Ari really talking about the collaboration, the research that she did. Um, and certainly um, the area that she's been working on with her students. So um, I thought that was just another little example. Um, certainly as we move into the different TEPL components, what's important is um, there are four different components of TEPL. So at the end of every mid-year and then certainly at the end of the year, teachers are asked to reflect in these four areas. So they go back and they reflect in their educator observation of practice. They take a look at those domains. They take a look at those indicators. And they talk about how they've applied those uh, in their classroom. They'll talk about areas that they see as real growths and areas that they're continuing to work on. Um, they're always reflecting on student growth. So not only in this area do they reflect on the way that their students have grown under their professional growth plan, but then they also talk about all the different kinds of assessments that they do with the students to make sure that they're hitting the meeting all of those needs. Um, and they're required to talk about students that um, are maybe at a high level versus students that are at a low level and how are they differentiating and meeting all those needs of children that might have an IEP or, or children that might be challenged within their classroom. Um, and that's really important. And then the next two areas are really an opportunity for them to reflect on how they've contributed to the whole school student learning goal and the learning community growth goal. And so those are two goals that every building has in the district here. Um, and those are usually determined by the leadership team within the building and their areas of focus. And everybody contributes towards those areas of focus. So when you bring it to the summative evaluation, oops, sorry, Chris, you and I are. <laughs> um, it's an opportunity not only at the summative time for the teacher to reflect, it's also an opportunity for the administrator now to reflect um, and have conversations with the teacher. So there's a four-level rubric for each of the core components. Um, and that four-level rubric is below standard, developing, accomplished, and exemplary. Um, and they're rated in each of those categories, those four areas. Um, it's a great, great opportunity to get some descriptive feedback, which really goes into the guiding principle. So not only are the teachers receiving oral feedback throughout the course of the year on observations, they're also receiving written feedback on observations, and now they're also receiving summative feedback. This is a great opportunity for teachers to really reflect in their area um, that they want to grow in for next year. So a lot of times they're having conversations with their administrators um, on things that are going really well and then things that they're looking to continue to grow in as, and learn more about. Um, so we do believe that it captures the spirit of TEPL um, because it really gives a specific feedback to the teachers. Um, and what's very different about our plan than um, what's at the state level is that we use decision rules rather than an algorithm. Um, and that's just uh, an opportunity. And the student growth area and the educator observation of practice, um, they weigh heavily, more heavily than the t other two areas um, that the teachers have to reflect upon. So we really always go back and we look at the evidence of impact. Um, and we really have an opportunity to say that we believe our teachers have improved in their analysis of data and how they utilize data and how they use that data to inform their instruction, the conversations that we're having with teachers um, and that teachers are having with teachers themselves in study groups or looking at student work sessions really uh, shows that impact. We, um, the observations are rigorous and the frequency and it really does provide feedback to those teachers um, and gives them that opportunity to uh, listen and have conversations uh, with their administrators and talk about next steps. 
Um, and then really the study groups have encouraged collaboration across grade levels and disciplines. Um, it really is amazing to watch the educators uh, meet and read books together and have conversations about books and best practices and to participate in webinars um, and really even observe each other's practices and open each other's doors up and, and find out what's going on in your classroom. And it's okay to come into my room and take a look at what I'm doing and then have a conversation about it. Um, and I did want to just, um, Chris and I did want to just end with a video clip this evening, um, which really talks about the relationship between a math coach and a teacher in this case. Um, and really what you'll listen to is the math coach has uh, one area of focus on her PGP, and the teacher has a different focus, but yet they're collaborating because it's all about student learning, and it's all about improving this teacher's practice. So it's how the math coach helps the teacher to grow, and then how the teacher utilizes that math coach to help grow in his practice as well. Um, and I'll just share that. So working in domain five, professional learning and collaboration, um, I saw that there was a need to look at some extension work in grade three, looking at ways to stretch students' thinking, um, stretch teachers' instruction, and um, working with Bobby, we're looking at ways to look at the math standards, unpack the standards, and see how we can use that, put that into classroom instruction to help extend students. So we're looking at what do we want students to learn and how do we get them there. You know, I came to Jen at the beginning of the year uh, with my focus uh, specifically being in math uh, and how to best differentiate for my high learners. Um, and through the process, we sit down before each unit begins uh, and try to unpack the standards um, from third grade into fourth grade and, and see the progression of the standards. Um, by doing so and looking at this has kind of opened up my teaching as far as when a student has mastered um, a concept or begins the unit um, using the baseline assessments and uh, master those concepts before I even teach. It's, um, it's great that Jen and I get to work together so that I know where to go from there um, and there's no pause in my instruction um, and I'm able to you know, differentiate for those students and really give them what they need to be successful learners. What I'm doing differently is I'm able to now use all of the assessments, all of the baselines, um, and now has openly given me an, an opportunity to look at fourth grade, which I haven't done in the past. So I think it's expanded my, my math knowledge in a way to see where students are going. And it's also given me the ability to kind of look back and see when students aren't performing, let's say, at Benchmark. It'll kind of give me the opportunity to see what should have students have learned in the past or what concepts, you know, along the same progression. So just to give you an example, if we're talking about fractions uh, and talking about exploring fraction equivalency, um, you know, we, we look at, in second grade, they should have been able to partition, let's say, circles or rectangles into halves and thirds, where now in third grade, they should be, you know, using certain models, either number bonds or number lines. Um, and then in fourth grade, they're really, you know, recognizing equivalent fractions with different denominators. So it's, it's the same standard, just but the use of pro the progression of it um, has, like I said, that's the difference between probably last year and this year, is looking at the progression. And I think what I notice in Bobby's work is that what he sees um, to be a good strategy or a model to help with extension lessons, he's seeing the value of using it for kind of the general population of kids. So when he talks about setting the standards high, you know, something it's not, certain tools are not used exclusively for extension. It could be something that could support all learners. But sometimes you just have to, you know, take a risk and try it. Sometimes it works and sometimes you see where you need to pull back. but that comfort level and trying to understand it um, is something that's become evident in the classroom. So like I said, um, the teachers are really passionate about what they're doing in their regards to their professional growth plans. Um, I know Darren is here this evening and he his clip was very powerful as well and I'm sure he'd be happy to share um, in person uh, his experience and what he's been working on and certainly Zoe or, or any of the teachers really could talk about their professional growth plans. Um, we had to really work hard at cutting the video back because once we started interviewing them, the passion just came out and they were just so proud of all that they're doing and all that they've accomplished. Um, so at this time, uh, Chris and I are available to answer any questions that you may have.
Thank you, both of you. I know, um, you know, as I've heard people throughout the, the state have, you know, come to you asking to, you know, model their, you know, uh, teacher evaluation systems off of what all the good work that you did early on when the seed model was put out there. So um, thank you for, you know, sort of going outside of the box that was put together by the state and putting something together that really worked for this district and for the teachers. So um, let me open it up to any questions by anybody. Brendan? Can you uh, give us an example of how you use data in evaluation? Obviously, each classroom is a relatively small number, so it might be hard to use, you know, hard data. So can you just talk to us about how you use that? So at the uh, at those growth conferences that we mentioned, uh, teachers are bringing forward data that they have from district benchmarks, from unit assessments. Um, that's the quantitative data that they bring. Um, usually we looked as teams throughout the year at that data in an ongoing way. Um, so teams are constantly meeting to review that data. But a teacher will come at, at the mid-year, let's say even at the beginning of the year, and share, you know, here's where I see my students are based on, on these assessments and, and data that I have. But they also bring qualitative data. So they might bring um, observational data from reading conferences that they've had at the elementary level. They might bring writing samples um, for, stu for students. They might bring examples of problem solving tasks that students have undertaken. And they've used rubrics to score those, but they're also looking at children's growth over time qualitatively. Um, you know, how has this piece of writing, how does that look different than what that child was writing at the beginning of the year? You know, is there now voice in this work? Is there simply more on the page for a young child? Um, and sharing all of that. And it's really about celebrating the growth that students are making because what the data is is not just a point in time. We're really looking for teachers to be uh, embracing this idea of children growing over time. So um, we want all of our students to grow. So if a child's not meeting benchmarks, certainly when it, we're, we're having conversations as teams and with individual teachers about how we might continue to support children in meeting those benchmarks, but we have many children who are already meeting benchmarks or exceeding those benchmarks. So teachers are constantly looking at where's the next step for that child. Um, and that's the kind of data conversation that, that we have as well. Thanks. Hazel? I just, just as a fantastic description and very helpful to understand how it all functions and works. I wonder, do you have any impact or any things that the students have said to you, because this is a somewhat different approach than they perhaps have had in the past, and what has been their response to understanding uh, what you're talking about with them and setting the goals, and how do they feel in the process? I think actually it goes back to some of the data that teachers are probably most excited to share is when they've undertaken you know, a, a professional growth plan that they're very passionate about, and they're implementing new practices in the classroom, they're not just bringing forward the, the student work and the data, they're also bringing forward the excitement that they've experienced from students. And it's not as easy to capture that on a piece of paper um, or, or in a, a number, but often there's a video clip that they might share that shows the, the practice in action and just shows the engagement of students. Um, or has captured the conversations that students are having with each other, the discourse in the classroom. Um, and then they'll also capture snippets of what students have said um, that they've just scripted and said, here's, here's how I know it's making impact in terms of the enthusiasm and the engagement of their students. Just one question on top of that. Have you had any impact or any input from the students saying, um, I'd like to set one of these up myself for setting a plan after watching you and seeing you model it? Well, we do have uh, an indicator that speaks to students self-assessing and self-reflecting and goal setting for themselves. Uh, so many of our teachers actually over the, the past several years, they've worked through many of the indicators as areas of, of study and focus for themselves. And many are at that place now of saying, I want to start growing in my students their ability to self-assess and self-reflect and set goals for themselves. So we have many, many teachers who are working in those indicators where we are encouraging students to take ownership for their own learning. Um, it usually follows from teachers providing very specific feedback to students. Our teachers do a great job of that so that our students have the language to be able to reflect on their own learning and craft very specific goals for themselves with teacher guidance at times, particularly in the younger grades. Um, but as they move up 
um, through the years, we have many students who are self-assessing, self-reflecting, and setting their own goals and monitoring their progress towards those goals. It's a great gift. Penny? It's uh, exciting to see this program in full uh, bloom, and having you know looked at the meticulous way that you all developed it. One of the things I was wondering is when you were developing it, the state came out with their new standards, and there were some disconnects that had to be worked through where we were modifying. I know we get we get an exception every year to use our program rather than the state program, but I, I also remember from prior reports that we modified our program to meet what we thought would be some basic state requirements. And so one of the things I was wondering is are there areas where we should be, how, how are those modifications working? And are there areas where we should be going back to the state and saying, look, now we've worked it with this in these ways this number of years, you guys are requiring X, Y, Z. We, we don't think that's that effective. Um, it's costing us some resources that way. Uh, you know, I was just wondering, I, I mean, you're probably having all those conversations, but I was just sort of wondering, um, you know, what you could tell us about how that process is going. So certainly each year we apply for a waiver from the state of Connecticut and we've been successful in receiving our waiver. Um, I think probably the biggest um, difference is the algorithm. So um, we don't use an algorithm. So we use decision rules, and that's how we come up with it. We don't put everything down to a percentage. We don't say that student growth is 45% and um, observation of practice is another 45%, and this whole student learning is 10%, and you're scoring, and teachers are marking whether they've met their goal for, for their students or they haven't met their goal. Um, and I think this has allowed us to um, emphasize the growth model and having teachers really want to grow and take a risk with their professional growth plans um, because we're looking at how students grow over time and what they're doing in their classrooms to help students to grow over time. So we continue to have um, dialogue with the state. Um, we've had people who've called us to um, take a look at our plan to ask. Um, I think one of the things that they're most impressed with is the effective frameworks that we have for all of our related service providers, our psychologists, our occupational therapists, our speech and language therapists. Um, so they're always really excited to have conversations with us in that regards as well. Um, and I think right now the, the plan is working for us um, and I think at this point, we're happy with how we're moving forward. I think we continue to work with teachers about writing less. Um, our teachers <laughs> are love to share, and sometimes their mid-year write-ups and their summative write-ups are long and lengthy. Um, and we are constantly encouraging them that it's not a thesis, they don't need to write um, volumes, um, and that they could figure out ways to just share the highlights. Uh, but they're proud of all the work that they're doing. And so we, you know, we accept all of that. Maria? Um, I was curious how much time it is for the administrators per week with all the reports all the observations, the conference, the reports, and then the time for the teachers as well, I assume. So there, there are um, periods throughout the year um, where we have the growth conferences, and those sort of come in, in chunks. Uh, and so you know, as an administrator, we know, you know the, those weeks, early weeks in September, a lot of our time will be conferencing with teachers um, and balancing that with getting out into classrooms. Um, in, in being there at the start of the year. And then as everyone settles into the year, um, those mini observations become the, the, the bulk of the work that we're doing in terms of the TEPL system at that point. And those mini observations are part of the day. So um, they're unannounced for the most part. They're, they're short, they're usually about 10 to 15 minutes for a mini observation. And what's I think most powerful about them is it's the ongoing work of the school. So it's the ongoing work of, of teachers as they're going about their day teaching, being involved in professional conversations with their colleagues, and it's the ongoing work of the administrator to be out and about in the building, um, being a part of all of those conversations, a part of the, the lessons that are unfolding, and capturing that. Um, the comprehensive observations are primarily non-tenured teachers, um, and so those you know, are times that are are scheduled, um, and those are usually longer observations. Um, but 
those are three during the year. So those are, are manageable and you, you schedule them at, at various intervals. Um, it's, I think, about um, balancing the time and always leveraging it as these are great points of contact with our staff. Um, so for the administrator, it's really the ongoing work that keeps you connected to the teaching and learning that's going on every day in classrooms. And that's the most important work that we can do. And so this really builds in the opportunities to have um, those times in classrooms and then to also have times to discuss and, and have conversations with staff and support them as they're thinking through their next steps. And that's what we wanna be doing too, is having ongoing dialogue with our staff. Um, so I think it, it is time, but it's, it's time that is the work that we should be doing as administrators. Do you, um, do you have data, like longitudinal data to show teachers moving, probably earlier, younger, newer teachers, are at a lower level, do they move up? And what's the percentage of teachers that get less observations? Is it balanced? Or? So we do uh, watch to make sure that teachers are growing over time as well. Um, we have, you see the, the four levels of below standard, developing, accomplished, and exemplary. Um, the, that's our rubric that we're using with teachers. Uh, it's not as simple as a, a teacher saying, I'm all in developing. Often you have, Teachers who might have, particularly early on in their career, may have many areas where they're developing. We'd expect that as a beginning teacher. And then they're, they're moving into that accomplished realm. And they, they may even have indicators where they're already quite accomplished. And over time, we're looking to see that shift from developing into accomplished. And then as we have veteran teachers working in that accomplished area, we start to look at what would help you make the shift from accomplished over to exemplary. Are there certain descriptors within indicators that are um, places that a teacher might say, yeah, that's where I want to work. I want to, I really want to work moving from here to here. Um, we often talk about how you wouldn't live in exemplary. You're constantly looking to grow, and so we're looking at what's happening in accomplished, and how do we keep shifting up to exemplary um, from year to year. In terms of um, the numbers at each of those observation cycles, so to speak, Typically, our first and second year teachers have the comprehensive observations. That would be three comprehensive, so three scheduled observations. They have a pre-conference and a post-conference throughout the year. Uh, as teachers move into year three and four as non-tenure teachers, they have one comprehensive, and then they have a series of mini observations, approximately three to four mini observations. Um, what that does is it allows the administrator to still have that planning conversation with them before the observation, see a full lesson and a post-conference, um, but to also have the opportunity to have multiple, many more points of contact in short, um, shorter duration um, intervals with that teacher. And the teacher then also starts to really have a sense of what many observations are and, and how they are providing feedback so that then as a tenured teacher, many opt for um, all many observations, there are some who may say, I'd still like to have a comprehensive. I want a combination of a comprehensive and some minis. Um, and sometimes an administrator can recommend to a teacher and, and say, I'd like, I'd like for this year to make sure we have a comprehensive, that I think it's important that we sit down and talk through your planning um, before a lesson. I'd like to see a full lesson. Um, that's at the, always at the discretion of an administrator. It's also for a teacher to say, I'd like to have that. Um, most, as I mentioned, have found that the mini observations provide just that ongoing opportunity for, for points of contact that are meaningful and, uh, and part of the authentic sort of work that they're doing day in and day out. I, I do want to emphasize the time factor. I think Chris is, is being kind because it is um, very demanding on our administrators to, if you can imagine, that there's 25 to 30 certified staff that they're supervising, that they're meeting and having growth conferences with, that they're doing observations and meeting and having mid-year converse, conversations and summative evaluations and write-ups. Um, and that doesn't include non-certified staff that they're also supervising. So um, I do think that Chris is 100% correct when she talks about it's at the heart of what we do because it's all about helping our students to grow and, and helping our teachers to grow. And I think that's part of um, why our, our students do so well because our administrators are in the classrooms and really helping 
training to give feedback to teachers to help them to grow in their professional practice. Um, and it's, it's not meant to be a gotcha. It's really meant to be a growth model to help everybody to grow and ultimately help our students to learn and achieve um, the best that they can. Anyone else? Um, I just have uh, one question. So, you know, on your growth <coughs> continuum, you know, if you have a below standard uh, or an exemplary student, could you, or uh, teacher, if, if you could kind of discuss how you work with both tenured and non-tenured teachers um, who are being evaluated at the below standard level, you know, what, what kind of interventions can you, you know, do and you know so how do you work with those people and then and then I, I know you said that they you don't have teachers at the exemplary to to we do <laughs> yeah so how do you continue to motivate them and to continue to help them to grow when they're at that level so um, and yes yeah, so to clarify we do have teachers at that exemplary level um, but we also talk about you know the, the moving into exemplary uh, and we have a variety of staffing resources that help our teachers to grow, whether they're teachers that need to grow in their practice, say from below standard, moving, moving forward, um, or are at that exemplary level. We have curriculum specialists in the schools, department chairs um, as you move up through the grades, and their, their work and expertise in that curriculum area um, provides opportunities for staff to have collaborative conversations and continue to grow, and so many of the vehicles that we have um, embedded within the TEPL system allow for those exemplary teachers to network with each other and, and be able to set goals for themselves and continue to research and grow. Um, in terms of a teacher who may be at below standard, um, or some of our beginning teachers who maybe are coming in at developing, which we, we would expect, but we want them to, to grow and to accomplish, again, we have those staffing resources of our curriculum specialists, our curriculum coordinators. Um, we also have um, mentor teachers that our new teachers are assigned to. Um, and these are teachers who've been trained um, under the team model uh, to support beginning teachers. Um, we also, if we have a teacher who is uh, you know, at, a, at a below standard level, we have a, a plan if that's a, a teacher, particularly if it's a, a tenured teacher, the state requires that we have what's called a structured assistance plan. So that's embedded in our system. That's sort of the evaluation component of our system. And it spells out specifically what types of supports we will provide as a district. Um, it includes mentors, uh, you know, partnering that teacher with a mentor. It, it entails making sure we're giving feedback to that staff member in terms of specific areas for growth um, and designating ways that um, we would encourage that, that teacher to continue to grow, visiting colleagues' classrooms, meeting with other colleagues. Um, and so that, that's spelled out pretty clearly. And then there's um, frequent meetings that would occur to, to help give feedback to that staff member and help that staff member um, understand you know, where growth is needed and, and be able to share how that staff member is um, proceeding in, in, that, in that work. I think one of the areas I would also want to expand upon is the training that we do with our leadership team. Um, and that leadership team begins at the elementary level with you know, math coaches and reading coaches. Um, those often are, are reading specialists and math specialists who not only support students who might need um, tier two instruction, but also really help teachers to grow in their practice and really help them to um, grow um, professionally and, and work through units of study. So you heard Bobby talking about meeting with that math specialist and unpacking the unit of study and talking about what are the standards within this unit of study and what's the baseline I'm going to use and then how am I going to differentiate the instruction for the students within my classroom. Um, so we work really hard with those people to train them to be coaches. Um, so how do you have those coaching conversations? How do you help a teacher to plan? How do you help a teacher to work sometimes even just on um, classroom management. So not only are they trained in the content, but they're also getting trained in, in the pedagogy and how to have those conversations. Um, we've expanded that even to working with our tech integrators and our librarians and how do you work with them on how do you integrate into units of study and, and work with the classroom teachers on um, and doing a collaborative model together. Um, so it's just a different approach. It may not be specifically coaching, but it's also on that collaboration. So we've done our layer of training with the administrators.
administrators where we're walking around and we're doing our calibration and we're in and out of classrooms. Um, and then it's really working with the next leadership team. So it's the department chairs, the coordinators, and then it's also working with math specialists, writing specialists, reading specialists. So all those people that can really help uh, everybody to grow. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Penny? I was just wondering if you could give us an example for a couple of schools of what the whole school student learning goal was for this year. So uh, I'll give the specific example of East. <laughs> <laughs> I know it well. Uh, for the past several years, actually, because I think what's important to understand about the whole school student learning is I think all of the principals, we work very hard to avoid it feeling like it's a new initiative each and every year. Um, so we try to have consistency from one year to the next with that whole school student learning to be able to really focus and go in depth and build off of what, what growth people have made in past years or what growth we've made as a school in past years. So for the past <coughs> several years at East, we had focused on, um, as a whole school, how to really look at higher order thinking with our students, um, critical thinking, depth of knowledge, um, how to integrate learning tasks that really brought up that level of thinking and looking at what does that mean for a kindergartner? What does it mean for even a first grader, a second grader, right on up at, at that elementary level? What is critical thinking and higher order thinking? So this year, we, we've tweaked that just a bit to say, yes, we want to look at critical thinking and higher order thinking, but specifically, how might technology be able to help us as a staff um, engage students in higher order thinking and critical thinking? So our staff um, are really looking at lots of ways to integrate technology into the work that they're doing with elementary students in a meaningful, um, purposeful way to elevate that level of thinking. So um, there's whole school student learning and there's also learning community growth. Those are the two school-based school um, focus areas. So whole school student learning is, as I just shared, sort of that, that piece around the growth we want to see in the student learning. Learning community growth comes from um, sort of work that we're doing as, uh, around school climate in the buildings. Um, this year at East, we are looking at the idea of self-regulation um, and looking at it first as adults, and that's been supported by our work with emotional intelligence, our ruler, um, the principles and tools that are coming um, from the ruler training that um, we'd engaged with Mark Brackett around and rolling that out with adults first and then looking at how some of those tools may be useful with students. So we really are seeing this as a two-year type of uh, learning community growth focus where we're growing our sort of awareness right now around our own um, emotional intelligence, self-regulation, and then moving that into the work we do with students next year. Thank you. Okay. Maria? Um, oh, since this came out as a result of the SEED mandate, are the teacher scores reported to the state? And are any other districts that you know of getting the waiver like New Canaan? So there are several districts that are getting waivers, um, like us. Um, every plan is slightly different. They may have um, adopted a specific framework that they might be using. So it may not be a complete uh, change in their system. So they might be using Danielson's framework um, versus the state framework. We created our own framework um, and have our own language within in that framework. Um, so there are districts like Weston that have um, a waiver. And I know, um, I think Darianne has a waiver. So there's several districts. When we first started, it was probably only about seven of us that had waivers, and, and that number has grown because they've um, allowed different ways in which you can, um, you know, apply for that waiver. Um, the second part of your question again was... Are the, are the scores reported to the state? So, yes, the scores are reported to the state, but they're not reported by individuals. So what you're doing is you're giving them um, the overall rating for all the certified staff, as well as the administrators. So the administrators have a leadership evaluation professional learning plan as well. They're all evaluated, um, and they, too, get ratings. So the two plans mirror one another. So you'll report out uh, the certified staff as far as where they fell in each of those ratings and the administrators where they fell in each of those ratings. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, so moving on to the statement of accounts with Dr. Keating. 
Good evening. Uh, before you tonight, you have the January Statement of Accounts, uh, seven months of activity for this fiscal year. Expended to date is 48.8% of our budget. Encumbered to date is 44.8% of our budget, which leaves a balance of 6.4% of our budget to be encumbered. And as I've mentioned in previous reports to the board, this is primarily made up of accounts that are not conducive to encumbrances such as salary accounts for timesheets, substitutes, drivers, campus monitors, stipends, tutors, and overtime. And then the payroll taxes associated with them. And we also have some variable accounts for utilities, supplies, and purchase services that are not encumbered routinely on a regular basis. So that, that's what makes up the 6.4% yet to be encumbered. We are tracking very closely to our reforecast as of December. 31st, we have one account, tuition at a district, that has had some new activity on it, pushing it up a little bit. But we are watching other accounts with, within the SPED budget with, a, with the thinking that perhaps we can cover some of that from balances remaining. If not, we would access the excess cost grant on the town side to cover those expenses. But otherwise, we are tracking uh, based on our reforecast, and there's no need for transfers, so we don't have any before you tonight. Any questions? You have any questions? I just, um, I guess this would be for Darlene. Um, with the tuition out of district, are we seeing new students uh, coming in or additional identification within uh, students that are here? And what we're actually seeing is students who are currently in district who are needing therapeutic placements. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, moving on to action items. Um, we have a uh, field trip request for the New Canaan High School VEX Robotics Competition, March 2nd through 4th, so coming up very shortly. Um, and if I could get... Um, I think you got some information about this in your Friday notes and uh, or maybe in the weekly packet. I can't remember where I saw it, but um, we, we, we got information about this. This is not a new competition that these um, students are attending. I think we've had this motion every year uh, for the last few years. Kudos to the, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Zamprano and his VEX Robotics team. It is, and the timing's always tight because yeah. they have to qualify to go on the trip. I think may, uh, be worried about approving it before they qualify because Hubris <laughs> says that would be the year they didn't qualify. So <laughs> it's always a bit tight um, as we do it, but they did just qualify recently up, um, where were they, up at Daniel Hand, and so they are looking to go to, uh, to Massachusetts this weekend. Great. So if I could get a motion to approve the VEX Robotics trip for the Southern New England Championship in Worcester, Mass. from March 2nd through the 4th, 2018. And Sherry, may I have a second? Penny, all those in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. And those that know Jim knows know that he would love to come give us an update after, uh, <laughs> after the competition. So yeah, we'd love we'll to see We'll extend him that invitation. Yes, we'd love to hear it. We can always like good stories. All right, um, do I have any comments from the public? Seeing none, um, announcements in future business, Dr. Lutzi. Sure, just sor short and sweet. We have a meeting next week. Uh, just it's a quirk of the calendar, given our uh, winter break last week and just how timing works out, so we'll be here. Uh, but before that, tomorrow night, we have a, a follow-up meeting with the Board of Finance to discuss the budget. Uh, we've received about a dozen or so questions from the Board of Finance that we've been working on. Uh, throughout the, the last week or so, and we'll be walking through those responses with the Board of Finance and there to answer questions and continue the dialogue with them. So that's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at uh, Town Hall. And there we have it. Okay, great. All right. Um, are we if I first on the agenda? Excuse me? First on the agenda tomorrow? I night? believe we are yeah. only on the agenda. Only on the agenda. Okay. Yes. <laughs> great. All right. So um, if I could get a motion to adjourn to executive session. Penny, second. Brendan, all those in favor. Okay, motion is adjourned to, uh, uh, it's unanimous, did I get that? Yes. Okay, we are adjourned to executive session. Perfect. Thank you.